All right, we probably need to get moving along here. We're running a little bit behind time, which means we'll cut, in, cut into the, uh, the break time. All right, thank you. All right, so this next session is uh, focused on the ecosystem for research networking, uh, exploring democratized access to research instruments. I'm Bar Von Osen, I'm the director of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and I'll be talking a little bit about the history of the ERN for those of you that are not familiar with it. And then uh, after me will be Faru, who'll talk about broadening the reach uh, which is focused on under-resourced colleges and universities and giving them access to so the democratization. And Maureen will talk a bit about uh, the actual work that we've been doing to connect up research instruments uh, within the national ecosystem. All right, so just to give you an idea, in 2017, a group of us uh, met at the uh, National Research Platform meeting in Montana back in 2017, so um, I'm always amazed when I, I see that date because uh, it just feels like it was yesterday, but uh, with COVID in between, I've lost a complete uh, sort of an idea of, of what time is all about. But you can see it was just um, uh, Rutgers, so I used to be at Rutgers University before being at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Uh, Ocean, which is a regional network provider in Rhode Island, so that's a research and education uh, network provider, and Kimber, which is a research and education network provider in the state of Pennsylvania. So just a small group of people listening to what was um, being discussed at the National Research Platform meeting and trying to decide if uh, there was something we could do up in the Northeast. So um, the National Research Platform was based off of something that was going on in California, connecting up the universities and uh, using what they call data transfer nodes. Um, and uh, uh, in the Northeast, we realized that just about all the states, if you put them together, fit in the entire state of, of uh, California. So a lot of small states, a lot of, of colleges and universities. I think uh, we went out there and uh, did a quick check, and I th believe there are around 2,000 colleges and universities across the entire Northeast, so it's really... Uh, a lot of colleges and universities. So there were some challenges in the Northeast that we had to uh, worry about. And so we thought if we could do it there, then actually it could be replicated across the country. So anyway, it was just a few of us. We had some ideas and said, okay, how do we do this? So in, 20, in January of 2018, um, a group of people came to Rutgers University, sat down and thought about okay, if we we're going to do this, what would it look like? And you can see that the list has grown a little bit longer. We've uh, uh, added the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center, Internet2, and NYSERNet, which is the regional network provider for uh, the state of New York. And uh, we decided that we needed something that could pull us all together and, and sort of um, get us discussing how we might do this. And so we came up with an idea of a federated proof of concept that was focused around research computing. And so um, several sites said, yeah, this is kind of cool, let's do it. Um, so we repurposed some older equipment, we connected it up over the networks, and so this is where the, the regional network providers uh, came in handy. Um, we looked at the way we could move data around, give people access, and you can see that uh, the list grew even longer. So we found that you know, if we put a stake in the ground and say, hey, let's do this, all of a sudden other people will say, yeah, that's kind of cool, let me try it too. So um, Syracuse came in, um, Edge, Google, uh, Maine uh, uh, jumped in and, and helped uh, think about uh, what this might look like. And as it says, it was an early, if not elegant approach, but the idea is that it was getting us talking and, and thinking about what we could do as a community. And um, through this, uh, again, because the network was really important, if you're doing federated services, um, there's a tool called Perf Sonar. It allows you to sort of understand the connections be all, between all the different sites. And uh, so we set that up so that we could see where the, um, uh, some of the pain points would be if we were going to uh, uh, let people access different uh, data sets that were distributed around the region. 
Um, and, then, uh, and then as we started doing more and more of this, uh, the interest started growing and got us thinking, oh, you know, we're actually being successful in this. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should formalize it somehow. And so um, originally the ERN was the Eastern Regional Network, and network was used as in a network of people, a network of universities. So it was a really a consortium of, of people and universities. And, um, and as you can see, all of the above, plus uh, Delaware, uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology, Buffalo, Bucknell. So the list kept getting longer and longer and longer as we started doing this. And so anyway, we, we got really excited about what this might look like as we started building it out. So anyway, we, we, um, we ended up formalizing it. Uh, we came up with a vision and a mission. And if you look closely in the, in the blue areas, you know, you don't have to read the whole thing, but really it's around uh, supporting and enabling collaborative data and computational enabled science, uh, building out standards, blueprints, policies, and training. And then the last bit is around democratizing access to research instruments. So, um, and so we pivoted from looking at research computing to start looking at research instruments in general. So, um, so that was a, a, a mind shift, and that was uh, based on the fact that we got an NSF uh, Campus Cyber Infrastructure Planning Grant that um, actually when we were having one of our all hands meeting, it was announced that we got it, and this money allowed us to start building out working groups and really focusing on different uh, types of research instruments. And so uh, if you look at the list of working groups, we were you know, thinking about materials discovery, structural biology, and then what would be the architecture, federation, computer science component of it. Policies, we wanted to make sure that we had the policies in place before we started sharing services. And then broadening the reach, which uh, um, Faru will talk a bit about, the architecture and federation Maureen will be talking about. Um, but the idea is, um, you know, how do we start supporting research across the country and, um, and, and uh, you know, giving people access to these research instruments? So um, name change, uh, what happened was that we had more universities across the entire U.S. start to uh, reach out to us and get involved. And so we changed from Eastern to uh, ecosystem, we wanted to keep the ERN acronym, so we came up with ecosystem for research networking. Everyone just calls us ERN now, so I think most people don't even remember what it stands for, but uh, anyway, that's what it does stand for. And you might wonder why we focused on materials uh, discovery and structural biology. The reason is that um, after having conversations with uh, lots of researchers, we realized that if we could solve the problems uh, for materials discovery and structural biology with connecting up research instruments, we would actually be able to do much broader connections to other instruments as well. And we've, uh, we've tested it out with different types of instruments and we found that easily uh, could swap things in and out. So, um, so that was really the only reason. Um, we did submit another grant uh, and uh, one of the complaints was it was too many uh, science drivers, which you'd never hear from NSF, but supposedly, uh, we had too many science drivers, and they said, narrow it down. So we narrowed it down to uh, materials discovery and structural biology, and then everything else was broader impact, right? So, um, but anyway, uh, uh, so just some of the activities we've been involved in. So, um, of course, the working groups, we've been running workshops, we've been uh, you know, offering recommendations on data standards, uh, architectural blueprints and policies. You'll see some of that later in this talk. Um, and you know data management and uh, other things and uh, we, we again are interested in getting people involved with us so we put a pretty low bar in membership we just ask that you uh, like what we say in our vision and mission statement um, and to uh, give you I'm, I'm not going to ask you to read through all that but uh, you know it's it's a lot of different universities so it's small large you know R1 R2s uh, you know, small liberal arts colleges have been involved. We've had, uh, you know, different organizations, uh, industry partners, uh, research and educational networks and funding agencies working with us and thinking about what this might look like. And so um, uh, the next slide is actually going to be jumping over to broadening the reach. So I'm going to hand that over to Faru.
Thank you, Barr. Um, I'm Faru Garamani, Assistant Vice President for Research and Innovation at NJ Edge. NJ Edge is a regional research and education network, and the work that I do at, and we refer to it as Edge, at Edge is very synergistic with uh, uh, my role uh, on the ERN, broadening the reach as co-lead with uh, John Hicks. And it's a pleasure to be able to share some of the work that we've been working on. And we look forward to hearing from you on how the ERN um, can best serve the needs of your communities. So um, the mission of broadening the reach is to understand the needs of the diverse institutions, the emerging non-R1s, small, medium-sized institutions, including the MSIs, so that the ERN can have the broadest impact across multiple research disciplines. We identified very early on that uh, workforce uh, development is an important aspect of the work that we do with the ERN, um, preparing the next generation through integration of research and education, and uh, developing the computational expertise and CI professionals at all levels. And then um, a very important aspect of the ERN, and ERN broadening reach, has been building the community and developing strategies to reduce barriers to and improve opportunities for resource sharing and collaboration. The working group, like the other working groups, um, meet monthly. And um, we have um, surveyed the community to understand um, what are some important topic areas that we should be focusing on. And we've listed the topic areas. And, you know, at the very top is access, access to funding, access to expertise, access to resources for education, and, and access to the communities that are important. Um, as Barr mentioned, we've had a, a series of workshops and educational seminars and um, to understand the needs, but also to raise awareness to the resources that are available and the funding opportunities that are available and uh, to foster uh, collaboration among the community. We've shared the um, findings in publications and conferences such as this, and um, we're, uh, we've made recommendations to institutions based on current practices, uh, as well as some recommendations to the ERN on how the ERN can serve the community and, and some suggestions to the funding agencies. And most importantly, as um, there have been many significant partnerships that have been formed as, as Barr indicated, as well as um, a community that has come together um, of thought leaders uh, focused on uh, collaboration and uh, resource sharing. So some of the findings, and um, it's a work in progress, but there are many factors that are involved in reducing the barriers. And as I mentioned earlier, funding is, is an important aspect. There are limited funds uh, for expertise and resources. Multiple sources of funding are required, um, both from the institutional, as from the institution, as well as from funding agencies and um, models that are sustainable beyond when funding uh, sources are exhausted at the federal level or are um, necessary. Uh, infrastructure, uh, compute, storage, resource uh, uh, instruments, um, access to the cloud. Um, there are existing infrastructure resources that may not be appropriate or insufficient for the work that's uh, being uh, performed for research. And leveraging the cloud is both a challenge and, and a, um, an opportunity. And while there's knowledge that um, there are benefits to leveraging the cloud, there's also um, challenges associated with it. Uh, 
focused on uh, both adopting as well as navigating the cloud. And um, training is a another big uh, challenge. Um, the cloud relationship, it's a business relationship. So vendor management, cost management, and training are at the top of the list um, for challenges. Um, many of the challenges for the cloud are, are similar. Um, specifically, though, uh, cybersecurity management, procurement, and um, integration complexity, especially when multiple clouds are uh, involved. Uh, I mentioned expertise. Um, it's really hard to find the expertise to support the needs of the research community and support the resources that are being uh, required. In many cases, there's cultural campus uh, transformation that's required. Um, teaching is a top priority as, at many of these institutions, and therefore there are limited resources and time uh, for research. Uh, building relationships across campus and active information sharing, very specifically uh, bridging that gap a communication gap between enterprise IT and the research community uh, is a, an important aspect. And uh, gaining leadership support, having leadership understand the value of having resources available, and um, also the fact that having access to these resources uh, serve as recruitment tools for faculty as well as for uh, students. There's a need for standards and guidelines and standard practices and policies um, and striking that balance in policy between IT and research, especially in areas such as security policies, identity access management and authorization and using the cloud. Um, communities. Access to these communities are just as important as access to the technical technological resources. Um, and we will continue to um, help understand the needs of these communities through work workshops and seminars and outreach activities. We have an upcoming um, summit uh, that's April 11th and 12th. It will be in Pittsburgh. Uh, most likely at Carnegie Mellon University, and um, we have partnered with the Consortium of Liberal Arts Colleges for that summit, and we welcome participation. And then last but not least, um, we're, uh, we want to identify some uh, funding resources to support student internships. And I'm going to invite Maureen Doherty, who will um, review the CryoEM um, project update. Thank you, Farouk. Uh, my name is Maureen Doherty. I'm the program coordinator for EARN. And I'm here to talk about our project, CryoEM Instrument Pilot Project. And this was, okay. This doesn't like me. It is not. Try it this way. There we go. Okay, technology. So, um, what we were trying to do with this project is to address some of the concerns that were brought out in our outreach activities that uh, Farooq just spoke about. And we're trying to provide uh, remote access to instrumentation and the edge of campuses. And typically these are uh, secured behind firewalls, uh, a lot of different infrastructure restrictions, um, security policies, things that don't allow an easy access, particularly for the non-R1s and the underrepresented, under-resourced institutions. So um, what we did is reviewed these barriers and challenges, infrastructure, whether it's there or not, security, want to make sure that it's not so secure that it's difficult to use and causes people to do things that we don't want them to do. Um, policies that prevent uh, people to have access to these, whether it's local institution or the labs uh, policies. The complications of authentication, authorization, and access throughout the workflow. Uh, 
like I mentioned, ease of use, accounting. Um, these could be something that are used as a fee for service. So the accounting aspect might be difficult for these non-R1s to address. And then knowledge, expertise, and education. Um, just having the knowledge in order to create these pathways in a secure manner and actual uh, people to be able to use it in the proper optimal way can be very challenging for some of these groups. So our objectives, we want to make this easy, secure, a web-based portal um, with very simplified federated authentication, authorization, and access. We want to leverage the existing policies and procedures of the institution. We want to augment and not replace. It needs to be easy to use. We want to be able to create real-time workflows with uh, real parameter adjustments, leveraging edge computing. Um, we want to be able to leverage outside uh, resources for advanced ana analytics. Um, and we want to ensure that we have a secure data management system throughout the pathway, and this is particular for the large amounts of streaming data that we're getting. And then we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we want to leverage what's out there. We are a small group, so leveraging what someone else is doing is going to help us progress further. And then we're sharing our resources and our efforts with the community. And we have provided a GitHub link, and it's something that you can check on our website as well. So what we came up with is this particular project design. And what we do on, on the left side is the actual resource. This is the edge instrument for cryo-EM. This is uh, the transmission electron microscope. And what we've introduced is what we call the Earn OpenCI Cloudlet. And this has two components. It's the edge compute resource, and this is GPU and some storage. And this allows us to do pre-image processing so that we have a reduced uh, trend, uh, latency so that we can do that real-time parameter adjustment we talked about. And then we have the instrument portal. And this is the web-based access for the remote user to come in and use these various resources uh, in an easy fashion uh, so it's not complicated and anyone can do it. So this was the original design. And we started with phase one. Can we do this manually? We can't do it manually, we can't do it at all. So we partnered with Rutgers cryo -EM and Nano Imaging Facility, uh, Dr. Jason Kalber, and they have a transmission electron microscope from Thermal Fisher Scientific and a K2 uh, camera. And what you see here is the exact configuration. Uh, the edge resource has two systems that are ahead of the microscope. And those are proprietary systems. The camera then feeds into a camera server, which is also proprietary. We then mount that camera file system read only into eventually our cloudlet. So this is the setup. The cloudlet will then do the pre-image processing, leveraging a software application called CryoSpark. This is a standard CryoEM application. Another one is also called RelyOn. And we use the CryoSpark to do our workflow management, data management, and monitoring. So our science researcher logs into Rutgers VPN. This is totally uh, Rutgers individuals. And we have configured the pathway leveraging uh, proprietary, excuse me, um, private VLANs, creating access lists that restrict IP addresses and service ports and it makes it completely private and secure. Uh, our researcher is able to then log into the Cloudlet, uh, launch his CryoSpark application for the workflow management aspect. He then is able to uh, access the edge um, access bridge system, which then takes him to the microscope, modifies his parameters there, and he's able to then go back into CryoSpark and run his process. So this was able to be done manually. Everything worked. He ran a uh, C protein structure analysis, two days, 2.5 terabytes worth of data, and everything was fine, so we're very excited. We can do it manually, so let's automate. So the automation, we started with Open On Demand as our instrument portal, and we chose that because it's a well-received and uh, open uh, source resource and you know, community supported. And we worked with both Open On Demand and Thermal Fisher Trans, uh, 
Thermo Fisher Scientific, the vendor, to figure out the best way of accessing uh, the microscope. Uh, we did try various things. We want to keep in mind that while this is particularly for cryo-EM, we want to make it available for a broader community. We want to make sure that our solution is not tied just to this particular scientific instrument for cryo-EM, but for other types of microscopes, and then beyond that, other science domains. So the workflow was developed. Uh, we leveraged um, an outside expert because our group didn't have that expertise that we talked about as a challenge to our researchers. It was also a challenge for us. That expert was able to come in and leveraged his own private test bed and built um, a, a containerized open on demand using Podman and Builda. And we were able to run that on our cloudlet. And I'm really cutting over, you know, glossing over a lot of really crazy stuff that we encountered. Um, in the test bed, everything worked fine and lovely. He created a parameterized configuration file to work his scripts so that when we went off the test bed, which was running a particular operating system, he was using Globus and a flat file for his authentication. Our project, our um, production area was using CI login and a local instance of LDAP. Um, so it worked fine in test bed. Obviously, we had some, everything worked fine in production, not. So we had a lot of things we had to work out, and eventually we did, and we were able to launch his process again, and he was able to do a workflow. So it did take a lot of work and coordination and collaboration with the vendor as well as uh, with uh, the other institutions open on demand. So phase two, uh, now that we've got the basics there, we want to be able to leverage a few other things that we have as part of Rutgers, and that was a fabric node. Uh, Rutgers was in the process of standing up that fabric node, and what we were doing, we were going to create a slice, create our own fabric cloudlet, and replicate what we did in the urn instrument cloudlet. Um, unfortunately, Rutgers nodelet, uh, fabric node was not verified by the time we started this project. So instead of using the Rutgers cloudlet, excuse me, the Rutgers fabric node, we actually used one of Fabric's network center nodes. So in Washington, D.C., we created a slice using a Fabric uh, facility port and leveraging our existing infrastructure in Rutgers, created an environment where we could then uh, access the instrument portal on the Fabric node here in Washington, D.C. from New Jersey, which mounted and was able to process the microscope and the camera uh, streaming data from Rutgers. And we ran this uh, local in Washington, D.C., but we were monitoring and in accessing the microscope from Minnesota uh, during the Fabric's uh, K2, K7, excuse me, NIT7 uh, members meeting. So from Minnesota to Washington to Jersey, it all worked, and we were very excited that that was something that we were able to do. So we're now in the process of building that on the Rutgers fabric node now that that has been verified. The other thing we're doing is uh, while at Rutgers we were using Amaral cluster, for their additional analysis, the workflow goes from the camera to the edge resource, pre-image processing, that gets outputted to a read on, uh, to a, a file system off Amaral, and the analysis is, is done there. So instead of using Amaral, which is Rutgers cluster, we approached Pittsburgh Supercomputer, and we were able to work with them and build a workflow that leveraged Bridges 2 their cluster. So it went from Rutgers instrument cloudlet, access the microscope, data was transmitted from the microscope to the edge computing on Rutgers, the urn cloudlet, pre-image processing was done there, and then the additional analysis data was written out to Bridges 2, and the software was, uh, the analysis was done there 
local and our output came out. Now we haven't had a chance to do any analysis regarding latency. Um, we did not do a full test like we did with the manual process where he ran a full simulation. Uh, so that still has to be done to ensure that we have that real-time parameter adjustment. But it was working. Now our next project is to incorporate a true data management and workflow management system like Pegasus. Right now we're leveraging CryoSpark to do that work and that's very limited because that means that we have to use that particular software application and what we really want to make sure is that we're not limiting ourselves, we're providing a option that allows as robust system as possible. So that's why we're looking at Pegasus. So this is the efforts after a year and a half of our first phase one. This is Dr. We start Taylor. by going to the splash page. This site is going to be a portal for all of the electron microscopy resources. So I'm going to log in using my school's federated identity provider. This is the CI login that we talked about I'm earlier. I'm going to get a Duo 2FA push here. And now I'm at the splash page of the portal. So I can access instruments or do analysis uh, through these tools. And I'll access it through this button at the bottom here. So now I'm connected to the electron microscope. And what I'd like to do with this electron microscope, I think I'm going to acquire some data. So I've already started a session of analysis. We're going to connect to that now. And I've taken a few pictures already. And I'll just show you an element of the configuration. First, we've divided up our compute so that pre-processing is done locally, but the cluster is being used for the main processing after data reduction. And there is a watch folder on the instrument through the cross-mounted file system that we are accessing to get these images. Okay, now the images that I just started to collect are coming off. And so we can take a look at some of these images and see how they are. And how they are is pretty bad. Uh, what we can see here is these lines indicate that the water has formed ice crystals, and we don't want that. So, we're going to go back to the microscope, remotely control the microscope. And we're going to leave off this point and collect somewhere else on the grid. So uh, image 75 we've just collected, now we're going somewhere new, and image 76 is going to be at the next site. And what we should see is that by taking the interactive feedback from the live processing of the data, we were then able to redirect the microscope to a more appropriate target and make better use of our instrument time. So now that frames have been saved, the image will almost immediately appear in the analysis window. It's now in progress as the GPU acts on it. And the A1000 GPU has finished the frame alignment. And now we see that we have a much better image quality that is giving us the type of data that we want to have. This demo is complete. I will log out. Okay. Now it took us about a year and a half to get this far. And if you recall uh, one of the icons, he actually had two microscopes shown and that was because we were doing a demo at SC22 and we couldn't get uh, the microscope revert reserve for the demo there. And while it, like I said, a year and a half for that, it took us one week from saying maybe we can use the ion burner 
and for them to have that available. And that's because of the way it was consciously decided to make something robust, flexible, and dynamic so that we could add those other instruments that easily. So in conclusion, this is working. We are able to make those real-time adjustments. We are leveraging the edge computing. We have reduced some of the I.O. Dr. Kaler and his lab currently are the only ones who can access this right now. We still have work to do, but they are using this in their production. Lessons learned, security is still an issue, and expertise is key. Uh, we had to reach out because we didn't have the expertise, which means there are other groups out there that would need it as well. So by providing this, it will make it easier for others. Again, we don't own this. We share it. We provide it to our researchers. And um, we have a number of groups that are interested. The first, the, the group on the left are the ones that are participating. We have interested parties in the middle, and then we have our access sites that we're enabling, which similar to the, um, like the PSCs, Bridges 2. And these are the groups of people that are working with us. Um, all of the EARN groups, Open On Demand, uh, Fabric, and Feder uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing and Pedagogist's team. So if you want more information, please go visit our website, earnrp.org. I think we're also earnrp.ci now, or earn.ci. 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 Um, we are over time, um, but if no one kicks us out, maybe we can have some questions. <laughs> yes, sir. So the, uh, the way I see it is that um, this is where the training is going to be really key. Um, accessing it remotely uh, will be important because a lot of times they can't travel to the site. And so this is where uh, partnering with either the university or if they have their own samples, have it shipped uh, ahead of time. And so have somebody in the lab actually loading the samples beforehand and so so we are tying this in directly with all of the core services that universities have like um, for example iLab so you can reserve the time on it and, and all of that piece but uh, before you even get there you just have to go through some of the training they could just um, you know have somebody from that site uh, work very closely with that class and, and, and educate them on it so uh, that is a, an important component of it. So that was really great and fascinating. And as someone who does a lot of streaming data infrastructure development, I'm really interested, Maureen, in, uh, you mentioned that the data is streaming, but um, is it uh, what someone who really works on streams would think of like Uber Streams and Apache Kafka, or is it like Globus connectivity uh, from site to site and moving on automated fashion? So we're leveraging CryoSpark to do the data transfer transfers. Okay. Um, we and then we have the file systems that are being cross mounted. So in the local one to Rutgers, the file systems are all mounted into the cloudlet, and um, CryoSpark is reading from one monitored file system and writing to another, and then launching those jobs for Amaral. When, and it, because we are mounting in from bridges into the cloudlet, it does the same there. So eventually we will have to find another solution because that's only tied to both like CryoEM, uh, excuse me, CryoSpark and RelyOn. And that's why we're looking at Pegasus or other data management or workflow management systems. 
So I'll talk to you afterwards about some streaming systems that we've built that I think might be have a role, like a partial role here. Yeah, that, that would be great. Be interesting. And yes. I think if, if I can also respond to someone who's done a lot of TEM work, I think that I actually think it's great that you've worked on something that's really hard to do and has a lot of other pieces because then other things will be easier. But I also think for actual applications, things like REU students, we have REU students who come for the summer and they go back to their institution, usually not R1 institutions because the way we select them, and they won't have access to come back to the lab, but they have a project that can continue and they have collaborators there and now they can continue to use an instrument. Obviously, the latency still gives a, a lot of difficulty in, and uh, they're not gonna run super easily and get the best data, but they can do what they came to do for their projects and continue that, so I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, the so. challenge is, is the connection from the smaller college or university to the national resources, so um, we work with uh, the Bridges 2 team t because, and Fabric, so Fabric is a national uh, uh, network uh, test bed and it's built on a terabit backbone. Yep. And so um, very, very fast. And so every national center is, has a fabric rack there. So we can leverage that, but it's getting from the campus to that, um, yep. to that uh, fabric uh, infrastructure. That's always the challenge, right? Yep. So. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? I think everybody went for a break. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs>